In the wake of ISIS, 2.7 million Syrian refugees descend on Turkey, and a dictator emerges. Former Muslim Ishik Abla responds to the recent coup attempt and shares why Christians there are now in extreme danger on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Some are calling it the battle for Turkey's soul and more evidence that Islam and democracy don't go together. The failed July 15th coup in Turkey that tried to topple President Erdogan's dictatorial regime has left the country unstable and growing more and more dangerous by the day. After the coup was squashed, Erdogan quickly vowed to purge the virus he claims triggered the revolt. So how did his purge play out? Well, since the uprising, Amnesty International reports over 10,000 Turkish citizens have been detained. Those arrested include members of the military, police officers, judges, journalists, teachers, even 60 students between the age of 14 and 17 have been charged with treason. Well, credible evidence shows some prisoners severely beaten, hogtied, starved, and denied water. Well, since the crackdown, 50,000 people have been fired from their jobs. And this instability will likely spill out into Turkey's neighboring countries, which could prove disastrous. Currently, Turkey hosts 2.7 million refugees. And since the, the coup, President Erdogan has shifted his focus to removing his opposition and away from dealing with the refugee crisis. If Turkey releases these refugees into Europe, this could lead to more terror attacks in Europe. But I think the bit bigger issue is what's going to happen with the Turkish government. Uh, he is talking about taking it back to be an Islamic state, which it was. It was called the Ottoman Empire. A uh, great Turkish leader, Ataturk, um, had the courage to say, no, we're going to be a secular state. In that process, he took the Hagia Sophia, which was a long-standing church over a thousand years. It was the biggest church in the world. Uh, under the Ottomans, it became a mosque. And he said, no, I'm going to make it into a museum. We need a secular constitution. We need a secular state. Uh, at the same time, he expelled all the Christians from Turkey. And so that's why Christ, uh, Christianity is practically non-existent in Turkey today. Uh, it's 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 highly charged environment. Uh, there have been some missionaries who've been uh, killed and have been abused. Uh, so we're dealing with a very volatile situation. And in biblical prophecy, uh, go look at Ezekiel 38. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about Gog and Magog, but there's another country in that list of countries that uh, bands together to attack Israel. And Gomer is on that list. And uh, Bible historians tell us Gomer is where modern day Turkey is. So here to give us her perspective on recent events in Turkey, uh, please welcome back to the show my dear friend, Ishik Abba. She's a former Muslim who's now an evangelist. You've, you've gone the other way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you Big do time. it through TV, you do it through social media. Uh, you're a Facebook phenomenon. You've had you know, millions of views uh, on Facebook. Uh, what, what's your take? What, where, where are we going in the current situation in Turkey? Well, I can look at the situation from natural eyes first, of course. From the natural eyes, it's very saddening. Uh, I grew up uh, during a civil war in Turkey and military troops ended it at that time. Mm -hmm. And we saw a little pitiful version of it, glimpse of it uh, today, what is happening in Turkey. And it's very shaky. Uh, people cannot trust the government at this point. And there is such a big division going on in my country right now. And it's very concerning. Uh, of course, it's heading to the most, uh, more Islamic direction. And it is very concerning. But from the spiritual eyes, when we look at it, we are in the end times. And this is almost uh, end times prophecies are being fulfilled because when you look at the world right now and what is going on, this is just a piece of the puzzle uh, Turkey is playing right now. I've been to Turkey and I, I think it's absolutely beautiful. Thank and you. I, you know, Istanbul is a, a cosmopolitan city. Yes. There's, I mean, it's, 
you know, the crossroads mm -hmm. of the world, and it links Europe with the Middle East, with Asia, uh, and uh, I've even gone into what, what I thought was going to be the countryside, to Izmir, uh, and found a thriving, beautiful city. Yes. With lots of prosperity, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like the people were very happy, well-fed, well-educated, uh, and prosperous. Why would they want to turn to to become a Muslim state? What? Why is that so attractive to them? Well, it is not uh, it, turning into Islamic state is attractive to them, and they were looking for a strong leader. And most of the time, strong leaders, whether on the go good direction or not, they get a lot of followers. So the personality of Erdogan uh, draw them. Uh, this crowds to him because Turkey for a long time lacking a strong president, strong leader. So this guy, he knows and he's idealist in his own way. And he has an ideology to follow and people needed that. People needed purpose. And Erdogan, whether right or wrong, he's giving that purpose to those people that are mm. looking for Turkey to be again great nation like it used to be. So he's giving them that dream that we can become an empire. And people are looking for that. Well, you you stood in front of the White House and put something out on Facebook. Let's let's take a look at that right now. When I came to this country, running away from my former fanatical Muslim husband for my life, this great country opened its doors to me, and it is a great grief for my heart to see what is happening in America right now. And I want to pray with you. I want you to join me in prayer right now to pray for a revival, great revival in the United States of America to take this nation back from radical Islam. And I was one of them and I know what Koran says. I know what the Koran talks about jihad and I was a former jihadist. And today, because of this great land, I have so much unconditional love because of my God who died on the cross for me. I used to worship as a former radical Muslim. I used to worship to a God who told me to go die and kill in his name. But today I worship an amazing God who came and died on the cross for me. And I'm, I am inviting everybody to know the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. Well, it seems like you feel strongly about this. <laughs> yes, very strongly. You seem, you seem so calm today. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I speak about Jesus Christ, I cannot be calm. <laughs> what got you so worked up in front of, what, what was it about being in front of the White House? What, what do you see, are, are, it, it seems like you're trying to wake us up. Yes. What do you think we need to be awakened to? Well, uh, revival is needed when something is dying. Somebody is dying. A small example of it is a CPR. And I see the church in the Western world, not only in America, is dying today. Mm -hmm. And we are spiritually lazy. And when we think that we have God, familiar spirits are operating. So we are far away from the truth, simple truth of the gospel. And that started, God started igniting me. I was not worked up. It was the Holy Spirit was just igniting that fire in me. And I could not hold it in, just Jeremiah said. I couldn't hold it anymore. And I am at that place right now. I cannot hold it in. What about Turkey? Yes. Um, Turkey used to be the center of Christianity. Yes. Um, Constantinople, the Hagia Sophia uh, was literally the center. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, it moved from Jerusalem to Constantinople and then ultimately moved to Rome. But now there, there are no Christians there. I mean, there, there are pockets of Christianity, there are pockets of revival. I think people are becoming awakened there. But this is a place where the Apostle John planted the churches. This is the place where the Apostle Paul planted churches. And now those same churches, all the seven churches of Revelation, uh, are all gone. Yes. Uh, what, what can we do there? Well, uh, when we earlier you talk about uh, Hagia Sophia, and it was a great uh, church. It was the largest church at that time. And when you look at the condition of the church in the sixth century, 
that church was declining in faith. There was witchcraft, that there was divination, and Christianity was not in the same shape or form of when uh, Paul left the church or John left the church. And we, saw, we see the results today. None of those churches exist in that land. And I think that's a great example and a warning sign for all of us in America or in the Western world that we cannot trust in what we have, our great churches. We can turn into Hagia Sophia and it can happen very soon. What we, can we do over there? We can only preach the gospel, you know. In 1 Corinthians 13, uh, it talks about when perfection comes, imperfection disappears. And that perfection is Jesus Christ. All we can do is to preach the gospel, preach the good news, and show the unconditional love of Jesus Christ with a passion, not any other agenda, not with a Western gospel, because I always say uh, Christian American God is not God of the Bible. And we need to go there with the simple truth of the gospel to save those lands. This is all we can do. Be pa passionate about it and on fire about it. It seems like you're passionate about it. A little bit, yeah. It seems like you're on <laughs> I fire. I still need on. more passion, but. <laughs> It seems like you, it's burning in your bones. You gotta, you've got to preach. Um, what, what do you think it's going to take for us to wake up? Well, God has been recently revealing to me big shaking is coming, and a lot of other preachers, pastors, they prophesy about that. But it is very soon. I think it's going to take something bigger than what happened. There have been some big shakings. Yes, but you it know, was not good enough. You go back to 2000 election where we uh -huh. couldn't determine who was actually, who won the election. Exactly. Then uh, you get 9-11. Uh, and I remember uh, the Sunday after 9-11, our churches were packed. Yes. And then it just seemed to go away. Yes. Then you have this terrible recession in 2008. Seems that God is shaking the uh, political scene, and then he shook our, our confidence mm -hmm. that we were secure in our borders, and then he shook our financial system uh, to its core with, with people f fearing that it was all going to collapse. Um, and what's left to shake? There's a lot left to shake. We are still in our comfort zones, and we are slowly dealing with the problems and tragedies but when something comes big to God's word says, I am going to shake once more heavens and the earth. And I think that kind of shake, shaking America hasn't experienced yet. I know that kind of shaking. I've been to Middle East. I grew up in the Middle East. I know when you have nothing. I met with refugees. All they have is Jesus. We haven't come to that point yet that all we have is and all we need is Jesus Christ. We are not there yet. We are hurting. We have drug abuse. We have dysfunctional families, divorce, abortions, perversion, everything. But we are just still sleeping in, in, in the midst of that mess. But God is going to bring something to our attention in a greater deal. And this is why my purpose, I believe, at this uh, moment and time to wake up people as many as they can join me in fasting and praying because God always takes care of his remnants. Yes, he does. Yes. And he always answers prayer. Amen. And we're going to be calling people to prayer. And I, I encourage you to join in with prayer. Uh, join with Ishak in her fast. Join in prayer. Uh, now more than ever, the church needs to be salt and light. We need to figure out we're the hope of the world. Uh, and the message of the gospel has been entrusted to us now. We need to go out and preach it. And so ask for the fire that Ishak has in her bones. Ask for that, that it won't be quenched, uh, that you'll preach and change hearts. Well, if you want to keep up with Ishak, I would encourage you to follow her on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. You can find all those links at her website at ishakalba.com. And it's always a pleasure to have you. I'm going to call you by your nickname. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's always good to have you here and keep that fire burning. I'm just, Thank you. I love it. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, coming up, a CBN News exclusive gospel recording artist James Fortune talks about assaulting his wife. I did put my hands on her. I did um, physically uh, restrain her and remove her from my room. At the end of the day, I was a perpetrator and I was an abuser. 
candid revelations from this popular performer when we come back. He had been at the top of the gospel music charts, but a few months ago, singer James Fortune put his career at risk. He faced a judge and pled guilty to assaulting his wife. Now Fortune is opening up about the incident. In this exclusive interview, he told Ephraim Graham that he hopes this will start a much needed conversation about domestic violence in the church. James Fortune's music has topped the gospel charts for more than a decade. Ministry was my life. You know, it's all I've known. I started playing the drums at five years old. Fortune is a preacher's kid from Houston, Texas. He's recorded seven albums, earned two Grammy nominations, and performed for packed crowds around the world. But in March, this singer and songwriter traded those venues guilty. for this courtroom where he pleaded guilty to assaulting his wife. You've been given five years probation. Yeah. Spent five days in jail. Yes. What were five days in jail for you, Minister of Music, like? I can't imagine any more than that. I mean, it was rough. I had a lot of time to just think. You know, I had a lot of time to think, why, why am I in here? What, what am I doing? You know, because I, I've sung in so many prisons. I've ministered in prisons. You know, we've gone to prisons and, I mean, maximum security prisons and shared the gospel and ministered. And now, you know, here I am as, as, a, as a, an inmate myself. And you did 175 hours community service? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm still doing it. Still them. doing that? Yeah. I'm and what does that involve? Whatever the city needs, picking up trash, cutting grass. It's, it's, not, it's not just chilling, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's not, I mean, you're right, it's Texas, Houston in the heat, so. James and his wife, Cheryl, are legally separated and can have no contact for the next five years. She isn't speaking publicly, but issued this statement to him in court. I hope in all of this you get help serious help. Although this probation might be like a slap on the wrist, I hope you look at it as a moment to better yourself and change something within you for your future. In terms of, of what happened, there are reports that you threw her against a wall, hit her with a stool, threw her out of the house. Were there any broken bones? There were no broken bones. There were no internal injuries. There was no broken pelvis. Those reports were false. Um, her being beat with a stool was, was false. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, like I said, I did put my hands on her. I did um, physically uh, restrain her and remove her from my room. This was something that was difficult for me because a lot of people were saying, you know, don't talk about it, you know, just kind of just let it, let it go and, you know, let people forget about it, hopefully, and move on with your life. But as I was praying, just my spirit that didn't sit well with me. And God was like, I want you to share your story because domestic violence is something that the church doesn't talk about. And so I'm basically stretching out saying, you know what, I was a person trade of a, uh, domestic violence. I was an abuser in more ways than one, uh, but I believe that's how God is healing me. Instead of just believing and praying, James is fully involved in the healing. Since the 2014 assault, he has been in therapy and allowed our cameras to follow him to a meeting. I've learned a lot more now since I've been in therapy. Um, for almost 18 months. Uh, I thought domestic violence was just, you know, if, if you hit your wife or if you, you know, slap your wife, but I found out there's so many, there's 18 forms of abuse and only one of them is physical. So I, it didn't start with physical. Um, that night, that's what caused me to be arrested, obviously. Um, but there was other forms of, of, of uh, abuse that I was a perpetrator of, intimidation, male privilege. You're certainly not a victim in this, but what all have you lost as a result? You can't even put a number on it, you know, because even now there's so many churches who just don't want to, um, don't want me in their church. You know, they don't want to have anything to do with, um, with my ministry. Um, a lot of concerts were canceled and who knows just the, the, the concerts that were, were potentially there that people say, you know what, no, we can't, um, we can't have anything to do with that name. Um, but that, that hasn't been my focus. There was a time when I didn't even think I would get to this place of, um, to feel um, the way I feel now. Uh, there was a place where it, it seemed like there was no light at the end of the tunnel. You were suicidal? I, I, I started off taking antidepressants just to help me sleep because I hadn't been getting any sleep um, for days upon days. Uh, so I was taking them to basically just get some rest. And I started uh, just feeling so guilty for what I had did, bad choices that I had made in my life. 
um, and I just didn't feel like I had anything to live for. So you have a bottle of pills that you're thinking I'm going to take and just end it all. Yeah. What stops you? Um, people were praying for me. So many people uh, were letting, letting me know that James, you know, it's not over. It's not the end. Uh, many pastors, uh, many Christian leaders around the, around the country and around the world uh, were reaching out to me. But you get to a point to where you're like, you know what, I don't even deserve forgiveness. I'm out of the reach of grace. For me personally, it was remembering even my grandmother's prayers, you know, praying for me as a, as a, as a boy. And, and God kind of told me something. He said, James, prayers don't expire. What's been the most difficult part? For me, the most difficult part is um, the separation, you know, um, from my family, mm. um, you know, even my children, you know, to not know exactly why um, their father is not around as much as he used to be and trying to explain that to them and let them know that, you know, I, I just made a horrible choice. Fortune spent six months separated from his four children. Oh, did he get it? These days, he's with them at least once a week. You posted on social media, please pray that during this process, God continues to perfect and restore me so that I'll become a better man, father, and Christian. Yeah. What's this process been like? I'm going to be honest, the process has been very, very um, beyond my expectations. My eyes have been open. Yeah, it started out rough. Yeah, I was suicidal and didn't think I had anything to live for. Didn't think my life had any more purpose. I'm like, you know, uh, it's, it's over. But to see how God just is able to keep me every day, I just kept going to sleep and waking up. Just kept going to sleep and waking up, believing that change was going to come. As I've shared, I share with other people what God has been doing through my life. So many other people are reaching out. And a lot of men are reaching out, but so many women are saying, you know what, we always hear the victims talk, uh, but we never hear the perpetrators speak Absolutely. about where, where this comes from and why this happens and, and how it's not their fault. So the process has been something that I would say was, was necessary. And there's still more work ahead for James Fortune and his family. And hopefully someday, this keeps me going. More music. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Houston, Texas. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes that I looked at the oppressed and I saw that there was no one to comfort them. And then I looked at the oppressor and saw that there was no one to comfort them. So often when we talk about domestic abuse, we're talking about the victims and we're not talking about the perpetrators, but what's left with them after they have this kind of violent episode uh, where they're out, now they're in the court system, uh, they're in the prison system, uh, but the biggest thing is they no longer have their family. Uh, they no longer have those relationships because they did something absolutely horrible. Who's there to comfort them? And the thought, just as it went through James's mind, the thought, I've done something I can never be forgiven for. Uh, this relationship will never be restored. God doesn't want to have anything to do with me. I looked at the oppressor and I saw there was no one to comfort them. The wonderful we news we have as Christians is we know a comforter and we can go to him and we can be honest with him about what happened, what we did, how things have turned out so horribly, how we never intended it, but here we are. And the great news is you can pour all of that out before him at the cross. He'll take that. He's not going to turn away from you. And the Bible says a broken and contrite heart he will not despise. Don't come to him denying. Don't come to him excusing it away. Come to him honestly and say, this is what I've done and I hate that and I hate myself for doing it. Can you change that? Can you change me? If you pray that with all of your heart, he'll receive you. And if you need help with that prayer, we're here for you. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to condemn you. We're here to tell you that there's a God who loves you and is able to restore. So call us 
888-777-1999. Well, here's a stat that will surprise you. Every nine seconds, a woman in the U.S. is assaulted or beaten. So if you're in an abusive situation and you're looking for help, we have help for you. It's called Focus Ministries. It's a faith-based domestic violence ministry. And all you have to do is go to their website, focusministries1.org. And if you need prayer, and if you're in this and you need to get out, uh, go to Focus Ministries. They'll be glad to help you. And you can also call us for prayer. Again, the number, 888-777-1999. Well, Reem is a 13-year-old girl whose best friend was killed by a bomb in Syria. She and her mother escaped to Lebanon, where they struggled to get by. Then Reem received an invitation that not only changed her life, it also gave her a promising future. Walking through the small apartment building she now calls home, Reem is reminded of her former life in Syria and how the war changed everything in an instant. The bombs fell without warning. One killed my best friend who was playing in a nearby field. Then a bomb hit our house and we ran. I was so scared. The family found a car and made their way through the checkpoints into southern Lebanon, claiming to be workers. When I met Reem's mother, she explained that they've lived in poverty in a shared apartment ever since. We often have to depend on others for help with food and rent. But one of the hardest things is seeing Reem not getting a good education. I would see her standing on the balcony, sadly watching other kids come home from school. She said she thought how nice it would feel to go to school. That made me cry. For a little while, I went to a public school that let in refugee children, but the teachers were mean and beat me and other Syrian refugees for no reason. So I stopped going. Then Reem was invited to come to the Heart for Lebanon Hope Center, which is supported by CBN. Here, she and hundreds of other refugees study English, Arabic, and math, and learn about the love of Jesus Christ. I love this school so much because the teachers treat us well and really care about us. My favorite thing is learning about Jesus and how he died on the cross to save people from their sins. All of the kids here come from Muslim families. Their parents know that this is an openly Christian school and that this is the best chance that they have at getting a good education. I have no problem at all with Reem going to a Christian school. On the contrary, she has developed a sense of love and forgiveness there. As a mother, I am supposed to teach my child these things. But she was learning the opposite because of the war in Syria. Now, she comes to me and tells me about good manners and a positive attitude. The Hope Center also shows Superbook in Arabic to help the children better understand the Bible. I really enjoy Superbook because I can see the stories of Jesus. I like that Jesus is teaching us not to lie or hurt others, but to respect life and forgive those that do bad to us. My favorite part is getting up and praying to Jesus after the Superbook episode. Reem and her mother also get food from Heart for Lebanon and CBN. Seeing Reem come home excited about school and ready for a good meal really makes me happy. She has a chance for a good future, which is very rare for girls in our culture. I just want to thank all the people who are helping support us. God bless you. I want to thank the Christians and everyone who is helping us with all my heart. I pray that people would stop doing evil things to one another. I know some of them don't want us to follow Jesus, but Jesus means the world to me. The gospel works. Here's a word for you for Romans. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 